Hey guys, it's Tom with Watching River. Thanks for joining me today. We've got another great day that the Lord has made for us and we will rejoice, right? And be glad in it. I got a lot of stuff to cover today. Uh, I'm going to remind you again, I'm not a prophet and I'm not a pastor. I'm just a dude who loves the Lord. I love talking about the Lord and, uh, you know, so sit back and grab a snack. Maybe you want a slice of bologna and a radish <laughs> or grab whatever you like to eat and drink when you're hanging out with me. So let's talk. Wow. Is the evil ramping up in this world? You know, every day when I wake up, I, I go through and I peruse the news, if you will. And I've been doing it. Uh, I try to see what's going on the, the previous 24 hours. And uh, I've been doing this almost two years every single day. And I, I got to tell you, I, I'm noticing such an uptick in evil in this world. Now, I don't concentrate on it because I love the Lord. I belong to the Lord. But the protests and riots and street fights and lawlessness, and it's just like every day, everywhere I look, I'm literally seeing it every day ramping up. We're in the last days. So so I always think, well, what do you expect? You know, did you expect the the last days to be moonbeams and lollipops? You know, you know. But Satan knows his time is short, and I believe that's why we're seeing such an uptick in evil. But as I always say, the more evil that permeates this world, the brighter that gospel message gets that Jesus paid for our sins with his blood. And he's getting ready to pull us out of here in a pre-tribulation rapture. And we're on the cusp of it. I really believe that. You know, we knew we knew evil would ramp up in the last days. We knew it would. But it reminded me of something that I read to you guys about, a, I'd say about a year ago. And I want to read it again. It's a transcript of a Paul Harvey broadcast that he did. Listen to this. 58 years ago. Keep that in mind as I read it, that he broadcasted this 50, almost, I'm 60, so I was two years old when this was broadcast. I, it blows my mind. It's called If I Were the Devil. And people who heard it back then thought it was outlandish. You know, it just sounded like a way to shock people. But wow, you listen to it now, you read it, it's amazing. It's amazing. Listen to this. Just, I really want you to picture this being read over, being broadcasted 58 years ago. Turning on the radio and hearing this. Okay? If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population. But I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, V. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers with the wisdom of a serpent. I would whisper to, to you as I whisper to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. Square is an old word for, you know, corny, I guess, you know. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our father, which are in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd, tran I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families that war with themselves, churches at war with themselves and nations at war with themselves until in until each in its turn was consumed and with promises of higher ratings i'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames 
my goodness, I'm taking a break here. Can you believe, like, how did this guy have that insight? It's like he read the future. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let those run wild until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbols of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give it to those who want until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what what do you bet I could get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich? I would caution against extremes and hard work and patriotism and moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on the TV is the way to be. And thus, I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey. Good day. That's what he used to say at the end of his broadcast. He was an amazing man. You know, we're in the very last days and we really need to know who the enemy is. We need to know who the enemy is, but way more important, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus in these last days. That's the most important thing because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So although we see the evil ramping up, we know we know our days are short here. We keep our eyes on Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Okay, let me open up my Bible app because before I get to the news, I want to read something. I think I'm going to read, I think I'm going to read Psalm 91. Is that okay with you guys? I think, I think we need to hear that one a lot these days. And I try to read it as much as I can. Here we go. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon me. See, this is verse 14, and this is where God is speaking now. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Tell me that is not a beautiful, comforting psalm. How beautiful is that? Wow, we have a God that loves us so much that he sent his son to come here to pay for our sins with his blood. 
knowing he, he was coming here to get brutalized and nailed to a cross. That's an incredible God. That is an incredible God. That lifts me up every day thinking about that. I never get bored with the gospel message. I never get bored with it. It's incredible. Okay, now we'll move on to some news, see what's going on. So this, this was from Jordan News. Israel to hold a conference on the preparation for the red heifer ritual. The Temple Institute is scheduled to hold a conference on Wednesday, yesterday, to discuss the religious preparations and performing the ritual of sacrificing the red heifer. And they did, in fact, have that conference yesterday. And they did a lot of talking. And it's very interesting days we are living in when we see these red heifers and we know they're saying there's five of them. And in the video that was live last night, they showed five. Now, before they said one was disqualified. So was there a decoy in there? I don't know. I've got to tell you. All right. I know. I know I'm alone with this. I know I'm alone with this. And I'm not saying it's for sure. I'm not saying this with 100% certainty. But it would not surprise me if they secretly, and I know people say, well, they can't do that. It would not surprise me if they secretly already burned one of those heifers for the ashes. I, I don't have any evidence of it. I'm just saying, I think when you wait 2,000 years for perfect red heifers, and they're now of the age, I can't see them wasting a minute. So during this live broadcast last night, when I saw five heifers there, I thought, well, there's got to be at least a decoy or two in there. But why would they, on a live video, show these five cows that they've waited 2,000 years for, gathered in one place with so many terrorists surrounding them that would love to see that area blown up. I, it just doesn't make sense to me. So it's total speculation. I'm not saying they already sacrificed it. I'm just saying I think it's possible. That's all. I don't understand how they would keep all five together in one spot. If you were in charge and you waited 2,000 years for perfect red heifers, would you really keep them all together? Wouldn't you keep like two in one place and two in another place? And, you know, you'd kind of, I, I would, it's common sense. So that's all. That's all. Speculation. Speculation. If that bothers you, have a cookie. <laughs> all right. Uh, rocket barrage this morning was being fired into northern Israel from Lebanon. Nine rockets were intercepted by the Iron Dome. No reports of injuries or damage, and the IDF is now shelling the launch sites with artillery. So that's going. That seems like a daily thing, doesn't it? Daily thing. Uh, Amir Sarfati said this morning over 130 British MPs, I believe that's members of Parliament, have sent a letter to the Foreign Minister urging for an arms embargo on Israel, citing Israel's non-compliance with the UN Security Council ceasefire resolution. Everyone has turned against Israel. Everyone. From the Jerusalem Post, every Hezbollah attack on Israel is more calculated than the last. Hezbollah escalated attacks on Israel this week, targeting Mat Moran on Tuesday and Kuryat Shimona on Wednesday, killing one man and wounding another. Hezbollah's dangerous escalation showcases the Iranian-backed terrorist group's attempt to keep Israelis from returning to the north and its attempt to carve out a control zone inside sovereign Israel. Yeah, it's just little by little, little escalations. Some commentators have compared this to a security zone, the area Israel used to control in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah now controls this area because it succeeded in, a, in enacting evacuations and continuously rains down rockets. Each of Hezbollah's attacks are more calculated than the previous. Yeah. The last days. This is, what's this from? The Times of Israel. With truce talks seemingly stuck, Israel said planning Rafah incursion in April or May. The pro Hezbollah, Al Akbar Daily, citing Egyptian sources who were said to have been in contact with Israel Defense Forces officials, reported 
that the expected offensive would come after the three-day holiday that follows Ramadan and ends around April 12th or in early May at the latest. The ground incursion inside the last bastion of Hamas in the Gaza Strip would last from four to eight weeks, the sources said, and would be accompanied by an evacuation of the civilian population sheltering in Rafah, um, which amounts to about 1.5 million people toward the center of the Strip along specific routes and at specific times announced to civilians in each of the cities in advance. This is what they've done throughout all the fighting. And many leaders around the world, many armies have said, you know, honestly, Israel did a better job getting civilians out. They worked harder at it than we would have. But nobody will tell you that. Nobody will tell you that. This is from Israel Radar. For the first time since Gaza war started, Israeli Air Force resumes training and prepares for a large-scale war on the northern front. Pilots are practicing massive strikes, long-range miss missions, etc. So that's what's going on there. Doesn't surprise me. There, you know, that front is going to open at some point. Is God going to enter before that front opens? Could be. That's how close to the rapture we could be. Netanyahu says Hamas should understand that international pressure on Israel will not work. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said on Wednesday his cancellation of a planned visit to Washington by top aides this week was meant to show Hamas that Israel would not bend to growing, internet, to growing international pressure to halt the war in Gaza. It was a message first and foremost to Hamas, don't bet on this pressure, it's not going to work. But a little later, I guess they did backtrack a little, and they're trying to schedule a meeting with uh, people in Washington sending some of their people. So we'll see what goes on there. This is from Barron's. Belgium urges calm after clashes between Turks and Kurds. I'm reading this because I saw crazy videos. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Belgium's Prime Minister Alexander de Croo called for calm on Wednesday after escalating tensions between Turkish and Kurdish groups in the country just days before local ele elections in Turkey. We are asking everyone to calm down, stop the provocations, and continue living together in harmony as we have done for decades in our country. This is just part of the lawlessness that we're seeing everywhere. Because these videos were people breaking shop fronts and beating up people and just the stuff. You almost get used to seeing it after a while, which is sad. It's all over the world. There have been a series of clashes between Turks and Kurds in eastern Belgium, including riots on Sunday with subsequent tit-for-tat claims. Yeah, there was a lot of video. I also saw this video. It's crazy. A violent fight and panic at the Paris airport as authorities reportedly attempted to deport a Kurdish national to Turkey. They were going crazy at the Paris airport. Crazy. What else do we got here? You guys have, you holding up all right, you guys? This is from Mail Online. The UK would run out of ammunition and equipment in less than two months in a war against Putin's Russia, defense chief admits. The UK would run out of it in less than two months. Can you imagine? We're living in crazy times. It's hard to make sense, honestly, of so much of what I see. This is from Insider Paper. Russia's spy chief visited North Korea for security talks. Russia and North Korea, they are buddy, buddy. A Russia spy chief visited Pyongyang earlier this week to discuss security cooperation. North Korea's state news agency reported today, Thursday, as the historical allies deepen ties amid Moscow's war in Ukraine. The head of Russian's SVR Foreign Intelligence Services, Sergei Nerishkin, met with North Korea State Minister Ri Chang Dae during his visit on March 25th to 27th. The officials discussed boosting cooperation to cope with the ever-growing spying and plotting moves by the hostile forces. They also shared cookies and cupcakes. I added that. I just I added that last line just to lighten it up a little, you know. But yeah, they're you know they're buddy buddy, and we've been seeing this for a while. I never thought I'd see the day when the world kind of you know leans on Russia, China, and North Korea, Iran. <laughs> it's strange days. Come back, Lord, we're waiting. Last 24 hours, 41 earthquakes over 4.0, 5 over 5.0. 
seems like kind of an average day these days for earthquakes. Um, this doesn't surprise me one bit. The ship that collapsed in Baltimore, that collapsed that Baltimore Bridge, was carrying hazardous materials. The cargo ship that caused the Baltimore Bridge collapse was carrying hazardous materials, the National Transportation Safety Board said. The chairperson, Jennifer Homendi, said there were are 56 containers aboard containing hazardous materials, including corrosives, flammables, lithium-ion batteries. She said some containers were breached and a sheen was identified in the water that will be dealt with by the authorities. She said the voyage data recorder has been recovered. Hamendi said the investigation could take 12 to 24 months, but that the NTSB will not hesitate to issue urgent safety recommendations during that time. <laughs> yeah, because the sheen on the water is going to stay for 24 months. <laughs> okay, we figured out what it is. Let's start cleaning it up. It's been two years. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little bit of clown world right there. It's a massive undertaking for an investigation, she said. It's a very tragic event. It is a very tragic event. You know, you would think they could hop on it pretty quick, like, but, you know, that's not the world we live in. All right. Just to show you guys that flying the friendly skies and all the weird things that happen on planes, it's not just the United States. Yesterday, I saw a photo. It showed a truck under an Emirates Airbus, a 380 plane at the Moscow airport, a truck literally ran into a plane and it was stuck underneath the plane. It's like, it's just that, it's not funny. Nobody got hurt, but it's just like, what is going on? What is going on? All right, here's another clown world story for you. Mamma Mia Star has been replaced with AI in BBC Project. An actress, listen to this, how long she did this. An actress who performed in the stage production of Mamma Mia for over a decade. She has been dropped from a BBC project because they've decided to give the gig to artificial intelligence instead. Musical theater star Sarah Poiser publicly shared a screenshot of an email she received from an unnamed production company which read, Sorry for the delay. We have had the approval from BBC to use the AI-generated voice, so we won't need Sarah anymore. Sobering, she captioned the post along with a sad-faced emoji. And they probably took her voice, obviously, with the AI. She's out of a job. We'll use the AI. That's clown world right there. That's I always tell you guys, I, I really think even beside all the Bible prophecy, all the signs that have converged, if you push them all aside, I don't think AI makes for a sustainable world. And some people don't agree with me. That's okay. I just don't, I don't see it. I don't see a sustainable world with that technology. It's too crazy and it's growing too fast. It's out of hand. All right, how about we do a testimony or two of the day? Let's do it. Kelly. The Lord saved my parents after many years of addiction, attempted suicide, and other things when I was 14. I ran from the Lord and came back to him at 26 years old and became born again. I went through years of marriage with alcoholism, pornography, and even adultery that resulted in an out-of-wedlock son. But God restored all the years the devil tried to steal and delivered my husband from alcoholism 13 years sober and reconciled our marriage. We just celebrated 25 years. We serve the Lord every day and use our testimony for his glory. God bless your ministry. God bless you, Kelly. God bless you. Yeah, the Lord does that. He makes all things new. He'll restore. He'll restore. Connie, I was saved in 1979 from spiritualism and all sorts of things. I was told it was a gift from God. One day a man pointed it out in the Bible that it was wrong. I denounced it that very day. I always loved God. I was six years old the first time I prayed, not knowing about salvation. I can look back now and see how the Holy Spirit was tugging at my heart from a very young age. I got saved and witnessed to the very one who got me into spiritualism, and they are saved too now. Praise God. 
And not long before that, they passed away. Not Yeah, not long before they passed away. Wow. Praise God. I think that would have happened at this time if I was still into that garbage. Thank you, Lord, so much. Praise God. Thank you for sharing that, Connie. Let's do a few comments of the day. In God's time. Please, please pray for all those who are sick, homeless, and starving because of wars. Pray for peace. Pray for God to step in now. Amen. That is good prayer. That is a very good prayer. Thank you. Amen. Allison. There is one thing that makes me think we are on the verge of the rapture. Israel has been abandoned by all. You're right, Allison. That is a major, major sign. People don't realize, man. You know, May 14th, 1948 is probably the biggest Bible prophecy sign. Israel becoming a nation in one day. But you are right. When the entire world abandons Israel, you look up for your redemption draws near. Luke, I love this comment. You know, I love hearing from the young people. After spending my whole day in a liberal anti-Christian high school, it's great to walk home and listen to a fellow servant of our Lord speaking the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, because that really blessed me. That really blessed me. And if you're walking right now, listening to this, be careful. <laughs> now I sound like a dad, don't I? Be careful. Isaiah 43.1 The earth is not my home. The evil in it can keep all of its money, cars, drugs, fame, gold or other corruptible materials, all of its empty promises and temporary temptations. I have Jesus and he is all I need. He gives me peace in my heart, the assurance of my home in heaven, and that's better than anything worldly. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Let's do one more. Craig, has anyone else noticed how many from around the world outside the USA are turning to Jesus and how many are having dreams and visions of the Lord. Grace is abounding. Redemption is happening, plus more evangelism happening outside the U.S. It's like the Lord is giving up on our country and churches, and churches here and fed up with the disgusting prosperity gospel. He's angry and filling out his calling of the times of the Gentiles. Remember the parable of the father of the bridegroom sending servants out to gather the invited to the wedding but they they were too busy. So he, in disgust, sends servants out to gather any in the streets who will come. Gotta love it. Be ready. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, I do think a lot of people in the United States are still coming to the Lord. I really do. But I know what you're saying. And I agree that many people around the world are having dreams and visions and coming to Jesus in countries that aren't Christian. You know, it's amazing. Amazing. All right. Time to share the gospel. So we've what have we let's let's sum let's summarize here. We've talked about how evil is growing in the world, and we've looked at news things that are happening all over the world. And we read the Paul Harvey if I were the devil thing. And I and I gotta tell you, that's all great. But if you don't know Jesus, you're still in the same place you were before the video started. You, you need to understand that time is very short. And you have an opportunity to turn to Jesus, to believe in what he did for you. And that opportunity has incredible eternal ramifications. So I'm going to tell you what Jesus did for you. And then the decision is yours. You know, then I'm done. But I'm going to tell you that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, God's only begotten son, left heaven to come to earth 2,000 years ago and put on human flesh. He was born he put on human flesh, and he was perfect. You see, he's the Lamb of God, and he's the only begotten Son of God, so he's perfect. He had to be the perfect sacrifice. You know, his blood is perfect, and his blood is precious, and he came here knowing he was going to shed his blood to pay for sins, so the entire sin debt would be paid. So the amazing thing is, once you understand the power of that blood and you have faith in that blood that it will wash you white as snow it'll take every sin you've ever committed or will commit and it will remove them from you as far as the east is from the west can you imagine 
That's what he did. And then when you believe that he went to the cross, died, and he rose again on the third day, he's coming back. Once you, once you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I understand now that your blood washes me white as snow. You paid for my sins, every single one of them. So, Lord, thank you. I have faith that your blood is washing me white as snow, and I believe you went to the cross. You were buried, and you rose again. And when you do that, you're saved. You're rapture ready, sealed until the day of redemption. He'll never let you out of the palm of his hand. It's the gospel. I'm telling you the gospel, the good news. The good news. Jesus wants to spend eternity with you. Well, why would he want to with me? Because he loves you. How do I know that? Because he got brutalized and nailed to a cross to take care of the sin problem. And he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance, everyone to turn to him. Repentance means you didn't believe before and you were facing in this direction. And all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, I heard the good news. I'm turning towards Jesus. I'm turning from unbelief to belief. I'm turning from my old way to resting in Jesus. You have repented. And he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to realize that he paid for your sins with his blood. So now you've heard that. And now you're left with the decision whether to say, uh, I don't need that. Or to say, I, I want that. If you're leaning at all toward, I want that, run to it. Because this may never come again. This opportunity may never come again in your entire life. And if you breathe your last breath without realizing the power of the blood of Jesus and what he did on the cross. If you just take your last breath rejecting this message, you're going to end up face to face with Jesus on judgment day. And it's going to be horrible because you're going to know. I remember when that guy told me the blood of Jesus washed me white as snow if I believed in. And I said, I don't need that. I don't need payment for my sins. You're going to realize it. You're going to know in that moment when you're kneeling before Jesus, like my sins are still with me. And the one who paid for them that I rejected the payment, he's right in front of me. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world. And I said, I don't need that. I'm fine. I'll take my chances. I'm more good than bad. And he'll say away from me, I never knew you. I don't think there's any more terrifying words that could be uttered from anyone than hearing those words from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, from the one who went to the cross to pay for your sins. And you know at that moment, no, I said no. Oh, that sends bad shivers down my spine, really. But now you've heard the whole thing and now it's your decision. I really hope you believe in the power of the blood and what Jesus did for you because he wants to spend eternity with you in paradise. So today is a day of salvation. So turn to him, okay? Now I am going to shut the camera off and I'm going to say a prayer for every person who watched this video. And if we're not raptured today, and my goodness, today is a perfectly good day for the rapture. But if not, God willing, I will see you guys tomorrow. I love you.